I've got a word from the Lord that I want to share with you today that I think will really, really help you. And um, last uh, at the end of last year, the Lord uh, at the end of last year, actually, I had prepared a series that I was really excited about and I'm still very excited about it. And I was getting ready and we were working on we were already starting to work on the uh, the artwork for it. And I was getting my my notes together for it. And uh, it was going to be a very powerful series that was going to lead up to Christmas and the end of the year. And and as I was preparing to launch that new series, the Lord kind of grabbed a hold of me as I was watching what was going on in the world and hearing about the tragedies that were going on in the world and all of the terrorism that was taking place uh, in the world and this this new uh, this this seemingly revival of fear and revival of terrorism. And the Lord arrested my heart and really spoke to me and he said, teach my people how to walk in their authority. And so I began to teach you back at the end of last year on walking in our authority. And you remember we did a, a, a message called who will stop the rain? We talked about how Elijah prayed that it would not rain. And in three and a half years, there was no rain until he prayed again. And we learned how he prayed. He exercised his authority. And the Bible says we are like Elijah. He was a man with a nature like ours. And if he could pray in that way, the Bible says the prayer of the righteous avails much. Amen. And so we learned about how to stop the rain, how to stop the rain of fear, how to stop the rain of depression, how to stop the rain of sickness, how to stop whatever rain is coming down, trying to rain on your life. God has given us authority to stop the rain. Then we talked about Joshua, how he stopped the sun and the earth stood still and the sun stood still and the moon stood still at his word, at his command. And then we talked about how Jesus spoke to the fig tree and he said, may no one eat fruit from you again. He didn't talk about the fig tree. Joshua didn't talk about the sun. He talked to the sun. Jesus didn't talk about the fig tree. He talked to the fig tree. Uh, he, uh, Elijah didn't talk about the rain. He talked to the rain and commanded it to stop until the rain heard from him again. And this is the kind of authority that we've been given as believers. And we've got to renew our mind to this. And it takes a little getting used to because we've we've been victims for so long. Christians have been victims of a false uh, a false gospel, a false religion. You know, I got to read this scripture to you. It really it's not in my notes, but I, I it just came to me and I want to I want to share it with you if I can find it. And it's in James chapter one, verse twenty six. It says verse I believe it's verse twenty six. He says, if a man among you claims to be religious or seems to be religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart and his religion is useless. You know, there is a lot of useless religion in the world today. There's a lot of useless Christian religion in the world today. You know why? Because he says the distinction is not does the person does the person live holy? Does he do everything right? Does he make does he ever make mistakes? He's not talking about that. What he's saying is if a person seems to be religious, seems to be uh, a person who fears God, who who walks with God, who pr uh, promotes Christianity and the gospel, yet he does not bridle his tongue. Now, when we think of bridle, we think of we, we unfortunately we don't think of a champion horse like we should, because when you bridle a horse re last year, a horse for the first time in over 30 years won the triple crown. The, the three jewels of horse racing are called the triple crown. And for the first time in over 30 years, one horse won all three of those races. And the and the, the reason why that horse not only was that horse gifted with great uh, skill and great muscular uh, strength and and great training, but the, the the horse was bridled the horse his strength was under control and his strength was used and directed in a certain direction 
to win the race or to win a series of races. And our tongue is a champion racehorse. Our tongue is a champion. Your tongue is supposed to win the triple crown. Your tongue is supposed to win and conquer in life. But you've got to bridle it. You've got to train it. You've got to put a harness on it and direct your tongue in the way that it's supposed to go. The Bible says death and life are in the power of your championship tongue. And you have to decide which direction you're going to point your words, which direction you're going to point your authority. And we've got to wake up and stop acting religious, seeming religious, and yet we haven't learned how to direct our words with our authority and begin to conquer things in life through the power of our words. Pray for things in life through the power of our words. Declare things in life through the power of our words. If we don't learn to get our tongue going in the right direction, it's not about, well, this person cusses or this person swore. He hasn't bridled his tongue. That's, oh, that's religious. That's, that's, that's poppycock. That's, that's just a bunch of religious jargon. Oh, he, he swore. Oh, he said a bad word. Oh, he said this or he said that. We get so focused on thinking that, that controlling our tongue means we never say something bad or we never get angry or we never get mad when really controlling our tongue means we're using our tongue to bring power in this earth by exercising our authority through our words. Otherwise, our religion is useless. One translation says it is worthless. It's worth nothing. Saying everything you believe means nothing until you start using that faith, exercising that faith, speaking to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. The person who is not bridled his tongue is a person who, who, who out of his mouth says, you know, I, I, I hope one day God will give me the victory. That person has not bridled his tongue because his tongue has not come under the authority of God's word. We've got to get our words in agreement with God's words. God says we have the victory, so we got to stop saying one day I hope to get the victory. God says by his stripes we're healed. We got to stop saying, oh God, I pray you'll heal me. I pray you'll heal me. I pray you'll heal me. You see, that sounds religious, but you haven't bridled your tongue. You haven't gotten your words in agreement with God's words. And therefore you can say, oh God, I pray you heal me. I pray you heal me. I pray you heal me. But God's given you authority to speak healing into the situation. Amen. That's bridling your tongue. God's given you authority to speak healing into your family, to speak healing into your body, to speak blessing over your children, to speak joy into your life and declare that there's joy coming into your life and that, that the Bible says that we have what we say. We can have what we say. Therefore, we have to learn to bridle our tongue so that our tongue is saying what the Bible says. When we get our words in agreement with God's words, we are now bridling our tongue. But when we have our words contrary to God's words, when we use our words to gossip, when we use our words to complain, when we use our words to speak negative, our words are not lined up with God's words. Do you know that I've got nothing to say to you or nothing to say about you except what God says about you? And if you say anything about me other than what God says about me, then you haven't bridled your tongue either. It doesn't mean we say everything we see. We don't need to say everything we see. We need to say everything God says. Because when we get our words in alignment with God's words, now we've bridled our tongue. Does this make sense? We'll come back to this another time. I want to come back to this, but I want you to I want you to understand your authority so that then you can use your tongue to direct your authority and stop taking life. Uh, as it comes and stop just letting the devil push you around, letting life push you around, letting demons push you around, letting uh, sickness push you around, letting financial problems push you around, letting the, the economy push you around, letting um, terrorists push you around, letting the government push you around. No, we are going to push life around with the words that we speak. We're the mountain movers. We are the mountain movers. The earth moves under our feet. The, moose, the earth moves because of our words. We've got authority to say to the mountain, be removed moved and it will obey us. Can anybody say amen today? Amen. Now watch this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. God gives us a picture of our authority and the Lord who now who is he talking about here? The Lord. 
whose idea is what we're about to talk about? It's the Lord's idea. And it says, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be a by the way, the head and not the tail. Always pick heads if you're in a coin toss. That worked for the Cardinals yesterday against the Green Bay Packers. They picked heads and it was heads. And funny thing was the coin was tossed, but it never flipped. It went up as a head and it came down as a head. That was an anointed, blessed coin. <laughs> Unless you're a Packers fan. And I know we have some of you that we're going to pray for you at the end of the service. Well, we don't have a dog in the hunt because our team didn't even make the playoffs. So for you Packers fans, congratulations. At least you made it into the playoffs, right? Our Bears are, are, have been hibernating for a few years, but they're coming out of hibernation next season. Amen. Come on. Where are my Bears fans? Come on. Yeah. I always pick heads when a coin is flipped because I just I, I don't care if it lands tails. I'm ahead and not the tail. But then he says, and you shall be above and not beneath. Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. I know it was a trick question. I apologize. I caught you, though. It's not it doesn't say and you shall be the head and not the. T it doesn't say you shall be above and not beneath. Look at what it says. It says you shall be above only. And not beneath. That means it leaves no room. For anything in the middle. We're above only and not beneath. We live from above. We've got to stop living from beneath. We've got to stop seeing ourselves beneath. We've got to stop praying from beneath. Oh, God, I'm just oh, Lordy, Lordy, if you don't help me. Oh, God, deliver. Oh, Lord, if you don't get me out of this one, I don't know what I'm going to do. Stop talking like that, first of all. And stop seeing yourself from beneath and start seeing yourself above the Lord. If the Lord will make you the head and not the tail above only and not beneath, then you need to start acting like you're living from above, not from beneath. God made you above. God made you the head. And that's who you are. You are above and not beneath. You are the head and not the tail. You are above only and not beneath. But you see, the problem is, is that many of us have gotten used to are the address of beneath. We've gotten used to that old address where we used to live. We got used to what we used to be called and and how we used to settle and how we used to accept. Have, have you seen the the um, the the commercials now for direct TV and they they have this guy who's like a he's a, he's from the 1800s with his son and next to him is a person living in modern times. But this family's living in in old pioneer times. And and um, and and the son comes up and says, oh, father, why can't we have direct TV like our next door neighbor? And he said, because, son, we are settlers and we settle for cable and we settle for things the way they are. And I love it because that's how so many Christians are. We've got to stop being settlers because we're going to live in the past. As long as we keep settling for what we used to have, we will never go on to what God has for us. We must never settle for being the tail anymore. Never settle for being defeated anymore. Never settle for being sick anymore. Somebody's going to say, oh, you know what? Every time February comes around, oh, you know, every time between winter and spring, every time I get the fever, every season I get the flu. We got to stop talking like we're expecting to be sick the rest of our lives. We got to stop talking like we're expecting our husband to cheat on us or our wife to not love us or treat us right or respect us. We got to stop talking like our kids are going to be rebellious. We got to start talking like God said to talk. And we got to start talking like we're the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. I hope this makes sense to somebody here today. We have the best seat in the house. We're the head and not the tail. Now, I want to announce to you your new address because every one of us has a new address, meaning we live in a place that we don't always realize we live and we don't always enjoy it because we don't realize that we've been given this new address. So many of us are still living at the old address. You know, I remember my old address. Does anybody remember their their first or second address as a little kid? I remember my address from being when I was four years old. I remember my address from being four years old. Five two five one Cold Spring Lane. 
Anybody know their old address? I remember my old address, but thankfully, I don't live at my old address anymore. Back then, my, my address looked like it was a big address. It looked like it was a victorious address. It looked like it was a good address. But when I looked at pictures and when I've, when I've gone back to look at the old address, I realized, wow, that was a tiny little house. Wow, that was a, uh, you know, that was a, a, a place with some, some memories that I'd like to overcome. And oh, that was a place where I realized at that time in my life, I was, a, I was the tail and not the head. And so I'm not going to live in that old address anymore because that old address reminds me of my pain. That old address reminds me of my abuse, uh, how I abused myself and, and defeated myself and destroyed my life and, and became an alcoholic at the time I was 16 years old, by the time I was 16 years old, and a drug addict by the time I was 16 years old. That old, that old address reminds me of an old way of living, and I needed to awaken myself to my new address, which, by the way, is the same address as you. You know that you and I live on the same street now? Now, if you're looking out of your natural street, if you're looking in your physical street and looking around down the corner from me, you won't find me there necessarily, but I'm talking about our spiritual address. I'm talking about where we are seated by God, where, are, where we are positioned by God. Here's your new address. Are you ready? You, you might want to make sure you change all your information, all your data in your computer and your phone because you need to put in your new address and you need to put in this auto filler for this address. And so whenever somebody asks you where you live, this auto filler of your new address shows up. And whenever the devil tells you that you belong at that old address, you need to make sure you type in your new address and that, let that auto filler of your new address fill the, 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 your mind and fill your mouth with where you now live. And where is it you now live? Here's where you live. Here's your new address. Are you ready? Ephesians 2 verse 6. Ephesians 2 verse 6 is your new address. And look at what it says. And he raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He raised us up when he raised up Jesus Christ and he made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are no longer at that old address of defeat, that old address of failure, that old address of abuse, that old address of loss, that old address of failure, that old address of sickness, that old address of disease, that old address of poverty, that old address of depression, that old address of loneliness. No, 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 no. We are no longer at that address anymore. Here's your new address. You have been raised up together with Christ Jesus and see with him in heavenly places. So when the devil says, where do you live? When somebody says, where do you live? Your answer is Ephesians 2 verse 6. Where do you, where, where is your, or somebody says, where is your new position? What's your position at your company? What's your position in the world? My position is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. My address is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. He has seated me with Christ in heavenly places, far above all dominion and over all authority and over every name that is named. That's your new address, Ephesians 2, 6. What's your new address? And, and, and Deuteronomy 28, 13 is also our new address, that we're the head and not the tail. We're above only and not beneath. You say, well, yeah, but that's if we do everything right. And no, that's in Christ Jesus we're seated. We're seated with him as the head and not the tail because we are now in Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 18 says, through one man's transgression, we became disobedient, just as through one man's obedience, verse, well, through one man's offense, death reign, but verse 18 goes on to say, through one man's transgression, judgment came to all, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Look at verse 19. Or, Verse, yes, verse 19, Romans chapter 5 goes on to say, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. That's you and me. Through, through, through Adam's disobedience we, we became sinners, but through Christ's obedience we are made righteous. Amen. Amen. And as the righteousness of God, go back to verse 17, through the abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness, we now reign in life through Jesus Christ. 
Through the abundance of grace and the gift of what? Righteousness. Righteousness we what? Reign. We reign in life. The Amplified, I believe, says we reign as kings in this life. We reign as kings in this life. Say, I reign as a king in this life through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Some of you aren't saying it. Say it again. Say, I reign in this life through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. I have authority over demons, over darkness, over the devil, over all the power of the enemy. You say, wait, 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 Pastor, how can you say that we have authority over all the power of the enemy? Because I'm bridling my tongue and I'm saying what God says. And according to what Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, let's look at there in Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. And in case you wonder, well, I never run into any serpents and I never run into any scorpions. Well, then maybe this will float your boat and over all the power of the enemy. Now, maybe that doesn't get you as excited as this one person over here that was clapping, but it gets me pretty, pretty fired up that that Jesus gave me and you and all of his sons and daughters authority to to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. How much power of the enemy? How much power of the enemy? He's given us authority over how much all the power of the enemy. So how much does that leave for the enemy? And then he says, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. How many things will hurt you? How many things does that leave to hurt you? How many things won't hurt you? I know that's like a trick question. It's like a double negative. <laughs> but nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being a Christian with useless religion. And the Bible says we have useless religion because we don't know how to direct our words, because we don't know how to speak the word with authority, because we don't know who we are. We don't know the power that we have. We're not walking like Jesus told us to walk. We're not saying what God says. And so we're living defeated lives. We're being pushed around by the devil. We're being pushed around by the media. We're being pushed around by the government. We're being pushed around by the news. We're being pushed around by the doctor's report, pushed around by whatever this person says or that person says. It's so funny how how every time we hear a word from God, we kind of analyze it and we examine it. And, you know, you hear maybe you're looking at me today and you're like, oh, I'm going to analyze this and I'm going to evaluate that. Oh, kind of uh, maybe that's true. And, you know, you're going through it when you read a scripture that says that all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. And you look at that and you're like, yeah, yeah, I know it says that, but let me think about that. And, and you start going through your filters in your mind and filters in your in your thought life and filters in your experiences in life. Life and and you, you know, you really we really assess sometimes when God's word says something and we like to evaluate it and assess it and weigh it and compare it to other verses and compare it to how we grew up and compare it to what so and so said on TV or what so and so said on the radio or what so and so said in the book that we read. But when the devil speaks to you and says you're never going to make it, you don't seem to analyze that as much. As soon as the devil says you're not going to make it, the next thing that comes out of your mouth is I ain't going to make it. <laughs> we don't analyze what the devil says. We don't criticize what the devil says. We don't we don't study and examine. Does this line up with what God says? The devil says something or somebody says something about me or somebody says something about somebody you care about or somebody says something about you and other people just go running with it as if it's the gospel truth. We don't examine the gossip. We don't evaluate it. We don't compare it to our knowledge of what the Bible says and our experience with this person. So we immediately grab a hold of negative words. We immediately 
accept the negative, but when anything positive is said, we're like, uh, I don't know. What the heck is wrong with us? That we so easily accept bad news and so difficultly accept good news. We need to change that around and realize that God is a good God. God is a yes God. God is an authority God. God is a faith God. God is a grace God. God is a love God. God is a promise God. And so I'm going to say yes to whatever he says yes to. And if he says yes to all of his promises, then I'm saying yes to all of his promises. I'm not going to analyze it. I'm not going to assess it. I'm not going to compare it. I'm not going to uh, evaluate it based on what I read in a book somewhere or what I heard somebody else say or what some other preacher said about it. I say yes to God's promises because God says yes to his promises. Amen. You get a hold of that. You'll never be stopped. Amen. You getting this? Amen. Your new address is Ephesians 2, 6. Thank you. It's Deuteronomy 28, 13. It's Luke 10, 19. You have authority. You have authority. Say, I have authority. I have authority. And I'm going to start walking in it. Aren't you ready to give up a life of struggle? A life of worrying about the future? Aren't you ready to give up a life of highs and lows and up and down and roller coaster Christianity? Aren't you tired of aren't you tired of a life? Are you ready to give up a life of where you're barely making it and maybe you won't make it or maybe you will if it would ever dawn on us? And one more thing. Aren't you tired of living a life where you're constantly wondering, am I being pleasing to the Lord? Aren't you tired of having to evaluate yourself all the time? worried about the future all the time, trying to recover from some failure or some loss all the time. Aren't you ready to give up that struggle? Because it's time to give that struggle up today. If this truth would ever dawn on us and register in our spirit, we're going to rise up as the giants in the land. We're going to be like those in the early church when it was said about them, behold, these that have turned the world upside down have come here also. If it could ever dawn on us the accomplishments of men and women who learned to use their authority in the Bible that God had placed in their hands and to speak with that authority that God had put on their tongue. The account of these men and women has given to us in Hebrews chapter 11. When you get a chance, read Hebrews chapter, chapter 11 and discover how kingdoms changed, how thrones were toppled, how armies were defeated, how fires were quenched, how mouths of lions were shut, how women received back their dead, how enemy armies were sent running away from the men and women of God who knew how to exercise their authority. And it is time for us to stop being overthrown by our enemy, stop running from our enemy, stop being devoured by the lions in the land, and start shutting the mouths of those lions. It's time for us to become the lion tamers. It's time for us to become the flamethrowers. It's time for us to become the kingdom topplers and the and the enemy overcomers and the army conquerors. We are more than conquerors, but we have not been living like it. So when we get bad news, it immediately crushes us and it immediately makes us afraid because we are taking bad news as the gospel. And it is not the gospel. It does not have final say in the matter. You have final say in the matter. You can let that you can let that bad news have final say in your life or you can tell it what to do and where to go. Amen. 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 That's the kind of authority that God has given us as Christians. Are you ready to embrace it? The power of God that flowed through the men and women who understood their authority. How did they walk in such power? How did they conquer kingdoms? How did they put foreign armies to flight? How did they shut the mouths of lions? How did they crush the heads of serpents? How did they command 
the rain to stop and command the storm to stop and command the mountains to move and command the sick to be healed? How did they command the dead to be raised? How did they get fish out of a, out of a, out of, how did they get coins out of a fish's mouth? How did they multiply five loaves and two fish? How did they experience the paralyzed rising up? How did they experience the sick being healed? How did they see where the church in Acts chapter 4, everybody's needs were met and there was not a needy one among them? How did they get to that place where they had unity, where they had love, where they got their prayers answered, where their authority grew and their power grew? How did they turn from men who ran from the cross when Jesus was dying on it to men who ran to the cross after he rose from the dead? How did they turn from men who were cowards and men who were running from God and running from the government and running from the Romans and running from the soldiers and running from Pilate and running from Herod and running from the Roman emperor? How did they turn from men who were running from them to men that were willing to walk into the arena with lions and not be afraid of losing their own lives? How did they come? How did they turn into these mighty men and these mighty women that were willing to stand up for what was good and what was honorable and for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let me tell you how they became those men and women. Because number one, they understood the authority that God had given them. How are we going to become like those men and women? We must, number one, understand the authority that God has given us. Behold, I give you authority. I give you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. How are we going to walk in this kind of Hebrews 11 power? How are we going to walk in this kind of Luke 10, 19 power? How are we going to walk in this kind of power where we shut the mouths of lions, where we stop the rain, where we quench the fire, where we, uh, where we put cause the sword to be put down? How are we going to be the people that rise up and overturn kingdoms and governments, not by political petitions, but by the power of faith, the authority of prayer, and the exercising of our authority in this life. Stop taking a back seat to Satan and to politics and to the world and to the dominions of this world and start taking our seat at our new address, seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're not taking the back seat where the Christianity and Christians ha don't have a say in, a, in our government and don't have a say in our country. We pray and the government obeys. That's how it becomes. We pray and the government obeys. We pray and demons obey. How do we become those kinds of people? How do we live with that kind of faith? Number one, we must understand our authority. We must know our authority. This is how we do it. We must know it. i got to know my authority. Number two, and we just went over where our authority came from. It came from Jesus in Luke 10, 19, and through the resurrection in Matthew chapter 28. We must, number one, know our authority. How did these people walk like these men and women in Hebrews chapter 11? They prayed with authority. So number one, they knew their authority. Number two, they prayed with authority. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, and when they prayed, Acts chapter 4, verse 31, and when they had prayed, when the Christians, when the disciples who knew their authority, when they prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken. We've got to get to a place in our lives where we know our authority so that when we pray, the place that we're praying is shaken. When we're praying over our government, the government shakes. When we pray over our finances, our debt shakes. When we pray over our health, sickness shakes and trembles and falls and crumbles. When they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Now, you can try to muster up boldness when you're speaking something negatively. You can try to muster up boldness when you're speaking something that is, that is bad news. But listen, when you speak the Word of God, you're going to have boldness. How did these men and women shake kingdoms, topple enemy armies, shut the mouths of lions, stop the rain. Because number one, they knew their authority. Number two, they prayed with authority. Uh, James 5, 17, six, James 5, 16 says, the prayer, the prayers of a righteous man avail much. The prayer 
of a righteous man avails much. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. A righteous man. How did we get our righteousness? Jesus became our sacrifice and through his obedience, we are made righteous. Amen. You're not made righteous through your obedience. You're made righteous through Christ's obedience. Amen. Say, I have the gift of righteousness. Therefore, my prayers avail much. Number one, they knew their authority. Number two, they prayed with authority. And number three, they spoke with authority. Now, let me show you how they spoke with authority. Go to uh, excuse me, Acts chapter three, verse four. Peter and John came up to this lame man at the beautiful gate. And in verse four, Peter looked straight at him and so did John. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So this man was lame at the beautiful gate for 40 years. And he said, look at us. And verse five says, so the man gave them his attention and the man looking up, expecting to receive something from them. And verse six. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have. I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Does that talk? Does that sound like somebody that's speaking without authority? Does that sound like somebody who's putting it all on God to determine whether it's going to happen? Does this sound like somebody who's waiting for God to do it? Or does this sound like somebody who understands whatever he binds on earth is bound in heaven and whatever he looses on earth is loosed in heaven? Does this sound like that kind of guy? That sounds like that kind of guy. It sounds like a man who knew his authority, a man who prayed with authority and a man who spoke with authority. Hey, look, forget about what you want. Let me tell you what I want. I want to give you what I got. I've got authority. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, did he say, oh, God, give this man the ability to rise up and walk? Did Jesus show up and say, rise and walk? Or did Peter show up and say, rise and walk? I mean, it's right here. It's not a trick question. Was it Jesus that walked up to this man and said, rise and walk in my name? Or was it Peter that walked up to this man and said, in the name of Jesus Christ? He's not saying in my he's not saying in the name of Peter, uh, Cephas, Simon, Peter, son of Barjona. No, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And look at what it says. Verse seven. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and he began leaping and praising God. Why? Because somebody knew their authority. Somebody prayed with authority and somebody spoke with authority. You walk out of here today. It is time for us to know our authority, to pray with our authority and to speak with our authority. And miracles are going to happen. And enemies are going to flee and mountains are going to move and fig trees are going to wither up and die and families are going to get better and your health is going to get better and your finances are going to get better and whatever is going on in your life is going to get better when you start walking in your authority, praying with your authority and speaking with your authority. Everything is going to get better because you have that kind of God given authority. Amen.